please. Allow me to show you something. Welcome to another episode of One Great Hand, the series that shows us some of the more interesting and entertaining moments that top players have had at the table. This time we feature seven-time Gold Cup winner and World Teams Championship medalist Peter Crouch. Hi, Peter. Thank you very much for coming along and joining the One Great Hand series. And you've picked a hand, I believe, from the Vanderbilt a few years back to tell us about. Yeah, I mean, it was in 2019. Um, it was, you know, before obviously we went into COVID. Um, it was, it was the last of, that year was the last of sort of American nationals before we had sort of a break from them because of COVID. I was playing on a team, uh, basically an American team with um, four American players, myself and Alex Hydes. And uh, we were playing the quarterfinals of the Vanderbilt, which is the main event um, in the US National in March 2019. And we got to the quarterfinals and we were playing against a very good team. Um, and the pair we were playing against in the first set was a pair called Brink and Driver, who most people would think was one of the best pairs in the world. Yeah, indeed. Certainly in, in the top 10 pairs in the world. And uh, we we were playing in 15, 15 board sets and um, we'd reached um, towards the end of the set and Alex and I have been doing quite well, which was good because they were a very strong pair. So talk us through the option then. Okay, so at the auction, Alex passed and, the, and Brink on my right opened the club, which was a multi-purpose bid, was forcing and um, could contain a number of hand types. His partner, uh, driver, bid a heart, showing uh, four or more hearts and at least seven high card points. And Brink, three bid two diamonds, which was 18, 20 balanced um, or some other hands, I think. And... Um, Two spades was a sort of relay from um, from uh, driver. And what Brink, is, sorry to interrupt you, Peter, but what do you think is the advantage of the system bid that they have bidding two diamonds there as opposed to bidding two no trumps, perhaps, which most of us would do? Yeah, I, I think two no trumps was probably some sort of artificial raise. I don't know the exact system. Um, but a lot of people... Also, the advantage of bidding two diamonds is they've got more room. Yeah. If you if you start the auction a heart a club of heart two no trumps, your auction continues at the three level. Um, if you start a heart a club of heart two diamonds, you've now got two hearts available, two spades available, two no trumps mm -hmm. available. You just have more room, and these hands are quite common. The balanced hands tend to be more common than the unbalanced hands, so making room with the balanced mm -hmm. hands is quite a good idea generally. So. What what happened here is I I don't know exactly what driver and brink system would have been, but two spades was basically a puppet or a relay, and and partner had to bid two no trumps, and now he could have shown all sorts of hands, and no doubt he could have shown other hands by going a different way directly. So it, this was a very good part of their method. So he bid three no trumps, and all I really knew at this point was De Clara had 18-20 balanced. He wouldn't have four hearts because Dummy had shown four hearts. Mm. And Dummy had enough for game opposite that because they'd shown seven or, or more initially. Okay. So when you get these sort of hands, you, you have to decide whether you want to be aggressive or passive. Now, generally, I think most experts tend to be more passive than, um, than most other players, most club players. And so for me, the choice was a passive ten of diamonds or an aggressive low club. With the hearts bid on my left, hearts was not really in the in the equation, and I wouldn't wouldn't ever consider a spade because one Alex had had a chance to bid a spade over a heart. He'd had a chance to open some sort of rubbish hand, you know, with two diamonds or something multi or something like that, or or two spades, sorry, weak. So spade didn't look likely so i went with the ten of diamonds which felt to me the right lead and i'm, I'm sure i would lead that another time okay um so, that, so dummy hit with what's roughly what you'd expect a minimum hand and he played clara played the queen of diamonds from the dummy and alex played the eight of diamonds now for us we play standard attitude with trip one after that we play upside down attitude maybe that's a little bit complex okay. but zia recommends that highly do you know why? Um, what's the what's the thinking is, behind that? Well, partly because you want to not 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 on this hand at all. But you, sometimes you, if you play low encouraging at trick one, which is very common in America and a lot of Europe, 
Um, you sometimes can't fail to unblock in the suit that you're, you need to unblock for partner. And if you then end up playing a high card, discouraging to unblock, then partner thinks you don't like the suit. So he's, he, you know, it's a method that I used to play upside down or with reverse attitude at trick one. And I switched to playing a standard at trick one and upside down after that. And I would say it's slightly better, but I don't think there's a huge amount in it. It just, ha it just happens occasionally, on an occasional hand, it, it helps you. Um, but there are hands where it doesn't work for you as well. With all signaling methods, um, you've got to decide, you know, what, what you think works best for you. And I would say upside down is generally better after trick one because when you've got, say, um, 10, 7, 3 in the suit, you can throw the 10 a lot of the time or the mm -hmm. 7. It doesn't really matter. But when you've got queen, 10, 8, 3, you sometimes need to keep the the eight or yeah, the ten, yeah, so you yeah, yeah. don't want to throw that card mm -hmm. or signal with that card. So that's where upside down tends to work better. Um, so anyway, what happened is the Clara covered with the queen, Alex um, ducked, but he he told me he had the king effectively by mm -hmm. playing the ace of diamonds or the ace, and, and Declara won in dummy. And Declara, Declara now um, had an interesting decision to make it to two. He decided to play a club to the nine. This would have been a very good if Alex had had queen jack of clubs because uh, he wouldn't have split or, and he would have then had three club tricks for certain. So anyway, I, I won and I had a pretty obvious continuation of the second diamond, mm -hmm. which was ducked all round. So I knew pretty much what the diamond position was here. Um, now I switched to the jack of spades. I didn't particularly have an easy switch here. A low club was a possibility. Yeah. I wasn't 100% certain that uh, uh, you know of, of the of the position, but or the or the or the, or the jack of clubs. Are. And anyway, Declara played the king of spades from dummy, and now played another spade at uh, trick five to his ten. Now he might have guessed to play um, run run the eight of spades or yeah. play a spade or play to his to seven. seven. Yeah, um, that was a possibility for him, but it was a big play for Declara to make that, and a spade to the ten was certainly very reasonable. Now, Declara then cashed the ace of clubs and the king of clubs, Alex pitching diamonds, um, and, uh, sorry, Alex pitched a diamond on the second, on the third club, and then he played a club to me, and Alex pitched his last diamond. So, by this stage, I basically knew the whole hand um, in terms of the distribution, and we just needed to stop Declara making a second heart trick. Mm -hmm. So, when you look at the position, if I lead a low heart now, Declara will play one of his three honours from dummy, and, and then win the ace and play a heart back to me and I'll have to give Declara heart tricks in dummy. So the only card I could play to stop Declara doing this was the King of Hearts. Now, it looks quite a flashy play, but in all honesty, it was quite a simple play and I didn't take very long about it at all. Um, I probably did it within a few seconds um, of getting in because by that stage, I knew what the hand was. And yeah, you say I it's simple, but it's, it's quite counterintuitive, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's an it's unusual play, but it wasn't. A, I would say it's not a difficult play. It's it, it's something that that um, you know you would be very disappointed to get wrong at the table. I, I would be, and um, you know, and, and Declara, you know, Declara obviously had played the hand very reasonably, mm -hmm. and it just happened to go down on the layout. Um, I think at the other table they had a leather heart, maybe. They didn't leave a diamond and the contract had made an overture. So it was, a lot of it was about going passive at, mm. at, uh, at trick one. And, and I'd recommend that a lot. Um, unless there's a good reason to lead a long suit. Um, here, my only long suit was, was their suit. So that wasn't very interesting. It's, it's quite a good idea to go passive and let mm. Clara make their own mistakes so rather than give them a trick early in the play. Absolutely. I mean, you say you'd have been disappointed to get it wrong. I'd have been wildly excited to get it right, but <laughs> that's that's the difference yeah. between the expert and the club player, I guess. But, um. Yeah, no, I, I, just, I think it's because sometimes you, I've seen these sort of positions before. I was discussing this with um, some people I, I work with, sometimes I coach and that, and, and I said to them, it's much harder for you when you're playing because a lot of the positions you've never seen before. Mm. When you've been playing bridge for 40 years, you've seen so many of these positions before that you don't think on a lot of hands. And, mm. you know, if you're a less experienced player and you're playing a 24 board set, you might be thinking on virtually every hand. While a lot of the so-called experts in inverted commas 
um, probably are only thinking on at most half the hands and maybe even less than that because they've seen the position so many times. They're just on sort of a semi-autopilot. Mm. Absolutely. I think that's a really good point about, and it's why uh, people can have the stamina to survive something that looks impossible, like the Bermuda Bowl schedule, for example, where, you know, the, the, think, the player who has to think on every hand or throughout every hand would just be mentally exhausted by, you know, like two days into that. So it, it must really help to, to be able to process on that level that's slightly subconscious a lot of the time. Yeah, and I think also there's a little bit of difference between pairs and teams here because it, it pairs, you probably need to think a little bit more because, you know, it teams, if the opponents are playing two clubs and you let them make an over trip for a 110 rather than 90, it's no it doesn't point. really matter too much. I mean, yeah, it might matter if you lose the match by one, then you're going to be very upset about mm. those sort of hands later on. But generally, that doesn't happen very often. So people don't worry too much about it. Uh, the odd over trick here and there at Imps, while they have yeah, to at nice. pairs. Indeed. Yeah. So um, that's that's a really good hand, Peter, really interesting. Uh, so we'll just like chat now about if you have a funny story. Do you have a good story for us that's... Um... Wow. I mean, I think what 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 I remember is some of the, some of the disasters. I tend to remember funny hands and disasters, and, and the disasters I remember are often because you don't concentrate... And you look, and you lose your focus. And certainly, it's something I was guilty of when I started playing um, reasonably high-level bridge, um, maybe thirty to five years ago. Um, I remember one hand where I claimed at trick one because I miscounted my tricks, and I had thought I had twelve tricks. I was playing a slam, so it was an important contract to get right. Mm. Now, on the actual layout, everything was sitting reasonably comfortably, and I could not have gone down if I hadn't claimed. But because I claimed and put my hand on the table, I had to go one off. And I think, I think from what I remember, it was a, it was a 14 trials, and I was, we were the only pair to bid the slam. So oh, this was wow. incredibly expensive. And, you know, this, these sort of things you, you learn through experience. And certainly I, I make less of those mistakes now than I would have done 35 years ago or 30 years ago. You learn from experience not to rush. Because if you're playing two spades and you've got nine or ten tricks, um, it's not so important to take a lot of time at trick one. Um, uh, maybe if you're playing pairs, it is, but not so important at ends. But if you're playing slams, and it, you should mm. at least make sure before you claim that you've got everything correct. At least 12 tricks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. doesn't matter 12, if you miss number 12. 30. <laughs> yeah. Who was your partner Absolutely. on that occasion? My partner was a guy called John Hobson who doesn't play anymore. He was a very... <laughs> did he never play player. again after that? <laughs> well, he, he, he did for a while, but he, he was like a lot of people. They had to make a decision about what was their priority and... Um, mm. He, you know, he's the guy I still see. I had lunch with him yesterday. Um, but he would have been a very, very good player. He was certainly a better player than I was. It's also difficult with um, situations with, you know, when you start bridge. I always think if you start bridge young, you have more time to waste on bridge. Exactly. I started bridge when I was really started seriously playing bridge when I was at university. And I spent three years probably spending more time doing bridge than I did my studies. Also, you yeah. think differently when you're young, I think. So, like, I teach quite a lot of nine and ten-year-olds now. So it's a uh, yeah, mental flexibility it's, thing, like with language, yeah. Yeah, it's a massive advantage to start early. Um, mm. If you, if, and I mean, if you, if you can um, also maybe play other card games when mm. you're younger, that helps as well. I mean, I didn't play a lot of bridge until I went to university. I hardly played any bridge. Well, we didn't have PlayStations as an option, whereas... No, uh, absolutely not. Yeah, obviously much more tempting for some now. But the interesting thing is when you do introduce Bridge as an alternative, many of the kids that I've seen really do take to it and really do enjoy it. So it is a viable competitor to the PlayStation, but it has to be shown to them. That's the thing. Yeah, mm. I, I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. And let's hope that some of the backlash against too much screen time may push things back in that direction in the future that people will play more games with their kids that are, are non-screen based and will have a whole new wave of bridge players coming up from an early age. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm.
Great. Okay, so thank you again, Peter. That's uh, really interesting, good stuff. Um, and uh, I'm sure that everyone will enjoy watching it and hearing your thoughts about that hand. Thanks again. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Sue. Peter is one of the many experts to play in the regular monthly New Tricks tournaments. You can register to enter these free tournaments at www.newtricksbridge.club. Or better still, win a chance to play with one of our experts by becoming a higher tier supporter at patreon.com forward slash NT Bridge. See you next time. Mm-hmm.